Now, friends, good evening. So, I'll be giving a very brief overview on this acute fatty liver of pregnancy. So, I hear this was asked as a DRNG question. Um, and this is in continuum of the recent presentation on acute uh, herpes virus fulminant liver that we presented. So, and that happened in pregnancy. So, it is good to have a little bit of a clarity in pregnancy if someone comes with a liver dysfunction uh, or a fulminant liver status. So, there are non pregnant causes like we just heard in the previous video about herpes simplex uh, causing fulminant liver so and there are obstetric causes so and acute fatty liver is something that can happen in pregnancy and all our trainees need to have some clarity on uh, deciphering the difference between uh, the non-pregnancy causes and the pregnancy and just to give a bit of a prelude all the pregnancy complications related to the liver tends to happen in the third trimester. So just remember that. So if you talk about preeclampsia, eclampsia, AFNT, or health, they all tend to happen in the third trimester. But the previous herpes simplex viral that happened in the second trimester. So that is also something one needs to have some clarity in the mind. So when you look at epidemiologically, between fatty liver and health, health is more common. As you see, the prevalence is still very low. It's 0 0.2 to 0.6%. And if you look at fatty liver, I'll just be calling it as AFLP through the narrative. It is much, much lower. It is 0.005 to 0.01%. Uh, so it's much lower than health. And if you look at the pre-eclampsia, it is little more. As you see, it is 5 to 7%. So this is the sort of, you see a relative sort of occurrence of fatty liver, health, and pre-eclampsia. And this is intrahepatic cholestasis that also can occur in pregnancy, mainly because of obesity, dietary changes, so on and so forth. That also tends to happen a little more commonly than AFLP at 0.1 to 0.3%. So these are some of the statistical data you can have in back of mind. And as already mentioned, the fatty liver of pregnancy tends to occur in the third trimester of pregnancy. They start with innocuous liver dysfunction, which progressively tends to worsen, leading to fulminant liver failure. So it is a progressive condition, so one needs to keep a tab on how the progression is happening and try to take certain measures to see and uh, prevent the further worsening. And the, the pathognomonic sort of a characterization of the liver is there will be centrilobular necrosis. So this is the lobule and this is the hepatic triad uh, just schematically shown. So there is a centrilobular uh, necrosis that happens. And there is a lot of steatosis. There is a lot of fat accumulation within the microvesicles. So it is microvesicular steatosis that tends to happen and centrilobular necrosis. And this remains the hallmark of AFLP. And liver biopsy is confirmatory of this because there's no way that we can make out these changes. And for all the trainees, when you're answering this question, possibly you may be expected to write this particular aspect. This is the key sort of a pathogenesis that happens, the fetal mitochondrial L-chat deficiency is what happens. Then the question arises, if fetal mitochondria has deficiency in L-chat, how does it affect mother? I'll just show you in the next slide. So the fetal long-chain hydroxyacyl CoA dehydrogenase deficiency is what leads to AFLP. And this is a genetically mediated. 20% of AFLPs have these deficiencies. And uh, this happens due to mutation. This is the, just a schematic representation of the gene. This happens due to mutation in this particular gene, gene 1528C, which leads to L-chat deficiency. And 20% of AFLP have this deficiency. So having said this, so the main cause is a multimodal sort of a pathogenesis. So one of the main pathogenesis is L-chat deficiency, but there are metabolic stressors along with environmental stressors as well, which contribute to causing uh, acute fatty liver of pregnancy. So then the question is, how come fetal mitochondrial L-chat deficiency causes? So what they have proposed or what they have hypothesized is the fetal L-chat deficiency leads to a lot of toxic metabolites. And one of them is the long-chain fatty acids. So all these long-chain fatty acids and the toxic metabolites, they traverse or they pass through the placental circulation, enter the maternal systemic circulation and affects the liver. And all these toxic metabolites, including the long chain fatty acids tends to accumulate in the liver causing fatty liver of pregnancy. And the question is, does it affect fetus? Yes, if fetus survives this acute fatty liver of pregnancy, they do have metabolic crisis within one year of the birth. And most of the kids do not survive more than one year is what has been referenced. So the screening for the fetal 
fetus for the fetus for deficiency of this L chat is something that is proposed if someone has survived fatty liver of pregnancy in the subsequent pregnancy. So this is something that has been proposed and one needs to bear this mind. Even if they survive, if the pregnancy survives this, the future childbirth has to be screened for L chat deficiency. And as I mentioned, L chat deficiency, 20%, but along with it, it, as I said, it's a multimodal pathogenesis. There is metabolic stresses that contribute as well. So it may be polycystic, it may be obesity, it may be gestational diabetes and environmental stress with a junk food like high fat diet. All these also contribute to all of this health, fatty liver of pregnancy and preeclampsia. And all, and all these three conditions, AFLP, health and preeclampsia, they tend to have an overlap and it may not be very easy to delineate between one and another. So that is something we all need to keep in mind. So for all our trainees, the diagnosis, you might have heard, this is a famous Swansea criteria. Uh, so I just put it pictorially because whatever literature you read, there are multiple tables. So I just tried to make it a little easy. Swansea criteria has a clinical component, has a sonological component, and has a lab component. So clinical component, the key hallmark, of AFLP is encephalopathy. Encephalopathy tends to predominate in these conditions. Health, there's not much of encephalopathy. I'll show the discriminatory factors. They tend to have nausea vomiting because liver is affected. They have abdominal pain and they have polyuria. So this, so in health, they tend to have proteinuria. Here they have polyuria and they can have polydipsia also. So which means gestational diabetes, if they have, that also could be hypothesized as one of the trigger for this. But encephalopathy, polyuria, abdominal pain, and nausea and vomiting are the key clinical component. And sonologically, you will see fatty changes in the liver, and it is char characteristically referenced as looking as a bright liver with a bit minimal ascites. So they can have a little bit of ascites around the liver, as we see, and liver appears bright due to the fat, uh, due to the fat accumulation. But the main giveaway is all the lab lab parameters. Total count will be more than 11,000. Uric acid will be high. But most of the indicators are pertaining to the liver. So in the liver, they'll have increased ALT. ALT is more specific to liver. And ALL stands for liver. So ALT, remember that way. Because in health, it is AST which is more. Because of hemolysis, AST will be more. Here, it will be more liver-specific ALT. Total bilirubin will be high. Uh, and it will be direct bilirubin. Because the liver is affected. In health, you will see more indirect bilirubin. And ammonia will be high. And of course, liver is affected. They'll have coagulopathy. And of course, liver is affected, they'll have hypoglycemia. And AKI, acute kidney injury, tends to occur much early on in uh, AFLP. In help, it tends to occur a little less commonly. So AKI is something that tends to happen more commonly in AFLP. Liver biopsy is very confirmatory of diagnosis. So one should have more than or equal to six of any of these criteria. Either it can be clinical, lab, or sonologically. More than or equal to six of these criteria. Uh, one can, in third trimester pregnancy, you could possibly say they have AFLP. So now the question is, if you look at any literature on AFLP, the whole literature will talk about how we differentiate between AFLP and health. So, and they'll put a lot of tables with a lot of statistics. I'll just try to simplify it with the picturization so that you can recall this much easier. As I said, encephalopathy is more common in AFLP. In HELP, it is less common. So 9 to 90. Why encephalopathy? Because here the root cause of the problem lies in the liver. So that's why you have to think of more liver-related problems that tends to happen in AFLP. And 29 to 100% will have jaundice. And HELP, jaundice is not as severe as in AFLP. Nausea vomiting happens. And DIC and coagulopathy, because it's liver affected, uh, thrombocytopenia and coagulation derangement tends to happen more commonly in AFLP. In health, there is low platelets, but not much of DIC and not much of derangement of coagulation profile. That tends to happen in 36 to 87%. And it is said if the antithrombin is deficient, less than 65%, it is confirmatory of AFLP is what has been suggested that low antithrombin, less than 65%, you can uh, you can pretty much sort of uh, make a diagnosis of AFLP. And as I said, AKI is more common in AFLP compared to health. 14 to 90% will have AKI. And polyarea tends to happen in 11 to 82%. So all these are liver-related. And in liver-related, direct bilirubin. Because liver is affected, direct bilirubin is high. And liver-specific enzyme, ALT, will be higher in AFLP. So this is, 
So for all our trainees, just remember this picture. All the liver associated features are more deranged in AFLP as opposed to health. And what about health? Health, the symptomology is more to do with eclampsia and preeclampsia. So they'll have headache and they'll have high blood pressure and they'll have abdominal pain and they have protein urea. So health has to be associated more with preeclampsia and eclampsia and they have clinical symptoms more to do with eclampsia and AFLP is more to do with liver related problems and malaise is present in 100%. And they have reduced haptoglobulin in HELP syndrome. So 95 to 97% have reduced haptoglobin. And you have more features related to hemolysis because, because, there is, because HELP itself is hemolysis, elevated liver enzymes, and low platelets. So all the features or the lab parameters you'll see is related to hemolysis. So you may have very high LDH. And indirect bilirubin is high. And AST is more. So those are the characterization of health. So very easy to remember. So help is more to do with eclampsia, preeclampsia, and more to do with hemolysis. And you may have uh, all the fragmented cells in peripheral smears, maybe some cystocytes, so on and so forth. But in fatty liver, it will be more to do with the liver problem. The confirmatory diagnosis uh, is uh, transjugular liver biopsy because the suggestion is not to do percutaneous liver biopsy because of the risk of bleeding. So transjugular intrahepatic liver biopsy is what is proposed. And uh, in the liver biopsy is what will confirm the diagnosis of AFLP where you'll have central orbular necrosis and microvesicular keratosis. So conclusion, so whatever you read about AFLP, that's all is there in the literature. So it's a very rare diagnosis. So remember those pictures. And the AFLP, all the features are more to do with the liver. And if you talk about Swansea criteria, it is the clinical component, sonological component, and lab component. If you divide that way, you can recall easily. So conclusion is AFLP and health both tend to have an overlap features. So you need to have that little bit of a clarity, alacrity in trying to delineate based on the lab features and based on uh, predominance of uh, liver that is affected, so on and so forth. And both of these occur in third trimester, and both of them definitely increases perinatal and maternal, both morbidity and mortality. The whole management principles, if you read, it is only good organ support, good ICO management, good organ support measures, and follow through of the trends that are evolving in these situations, and early expedition of the pregnancy. So the pregnancy, since they're in third trimester, early delivery of the fetus, and taking measures to improve the fetal maturity is the way to manage these patients. So, I, so most of the management is supportive and supporting the organs. And in our patients, as a norm, any liver dysfunction going into pulmonary, we do plasma exchange. So there's a lot of reports, anecdotal reports and case reports about success of plasma exchange. So we've had uh, AFLPs where we have done plasma exchange. And this is basically a bridge. It's like a dialysis. It's a bridge for liver support uh, if, uh, to prevent further worsening and maybe as a bridge to the transplant. So there is some evidence for flex plasma exchange as a bridge for these patients. And the salivate therapy, even despite this, if they go into liver failure, they do not improve, then liver transplantation has to be done. So that's all is there, folks, in uh, AFLP. So whatever literature you read, pretty much revolves around what I have said. So remember those pictures, which will help you to recall in exam as to how you would answer these questions. So thank you, friends. So you can visit my website. Uh, I mean, you can request or invite all of you to our signature conference gigs happening from 18 to 20th. So request you to submit your valuable work to Journal of Acute Care. And visit my website. There's a QR code there. So thank you. Thank you, one and all.